Welcome back to the Schofield Stories. This is part two of my interview with former Paralympic and world champion Mark Colburn. If you haven't listened to part one, I strongly advise you do. It is brilliant. But for now, let's pick things back up with Mark here on part two. I think you should. The light bulb went off in my head, Callum. The hairs went up on my neck. And I thought to myself, oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. I've been waiting for this moment all my life. I always aspired to be an athlete. You know, I looked up to the Olympic athletes in the 80s. You know, Daley Thompson, who was just an iconic figure for me. You know, um, being world class in 10 different events. Not just one, but 10 you know, it's just, it's mind blowing. And, and I said to this gentleman, do you know what? Thank you. Thank you for planting the seed, for lighting the light bulb that I've been waiting for, for probably the best part of 30 years, but I just never had the opportunity, you know? So, so that week, you know, we had a great week, raised loads of money for the air ambulance, for the charity, went home on the Saturday then, you know, back to my parents' house where I was living. And saying to my mother, I'll never forget, saying to my mother, I- I'm going to start training for the Paralympics next week, you know? And my mother, <laughs> my mother said to me, oh, okay. Um, oh, okay. Wonderful. Well, good luck. Um, what would you like for tea? That's such a Welsh <laughs> thing. <laughs> That's Welsh. That's a Welsh mother for you. It completely went over her head, you know, <laughs> because she's obviously not sport orientated, you know? Um, and then my dad saying to me, you know, what the hell are you on about? I said, look, next week, I'm going to start training for the Paralympics. I'm going to focus. I'm going to commit. You know, I've got two and a half years to literally get myself into the best shape possible. And my dad said to me, Mark, come here. Listen now. You broke your back. Okay. You broke your back. Just, just let it go. Just let this dream, this aspiration this vision, just, just let it go, you know, just go back to work. I said, dad, come here. I said, remember when I was a child? And he said, yeah. I said, you taught me when I was a child that if you, if you have a dream in life, whatever that dream is, okay, never, never let it go until your eyes close for good you know when you have a dream never give up and he said yes Mark but but Mark Mark listen you broke it I said dad you've already told me you don't need to repeat yourself I know what I'm doing I'm not stupid I'm not daft I'm just focused because I knew Callum that London 2012 was only going to happen once okay in my lifetime yeah. Okay. It was going to happen two and a half hours from where I live. It was literally going to happen in my backyard. And I, I remember saying to my dad, I've got to do this. I've got to do this because Christmas, think about this. Christmas come, comes and go, goes every year. Okay. If you miss this Christmas because you're in hospital or you're away on holidays, there's always next year. Okay. But London 2012 was only going to happen once. And I wanted to be there. That, that was the whole plan, just to be there, you know. And he turned to my mother, Margaret, I'll never forget. <laughs> and he said to my mother, Margaret, have a word with your son. I think he's lost it. <laughs> <laughs> That's brilliant. And, and he walked off. He walked off. And I said to him, look, understand, I'm going to be there. With or without you, I'm going to be there. I'm either going to be flying the flag for Great Britain, or you're going to see me dead on the side for trying. And don't bet against me, because I'm serious. And he walked away. And my mother turned to me, she said, you've upset him. <laughs> <laughs> what, think about this. Think about this. What if I'd listened to my dad? Yeah. What if I'd listened to my dad? The, 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 the world of cycling would have never have known I existed. No. Okay? So, so that's why I say to you, what you've done as a young man, you've made a decision, okay? You've made a decision to change your circumstance, to aspire for, 
for the unknown. Think about this. You know, the, the unknown life is just, you know, or the unexamined life is just not worth living sometimes. But in your case and my case, it's so much to aspire for, to, to step into the unknown, you know, because as human beings, as primates, you know, we were designed to, to be challenged. Okay, we were not made, I suppose you could use a term, a term that we use quite regular now, we are not copy and paste. We are not copy and paste. That's where we get bored. Yeah. Okay, that's where we get bored. So, you know, yes, stay safe, but challenge yourself because that's how you develop as a human being, you know? So, so that was June 2010 when, you know, I upset my dad, God love him, um, made my mother Margaret laugh. Yeah. <laughs> she thought I was crazy, but I wasn't crazy. I was far from crazy. I just wanted something more than anything because I had an opportunity exactly like this podcast. You know, my vision is to create a lasting change in humanity around the world, okay? It's been done before, okay? So the process works. It's just reaching the, the right amount of people every day through the different platforms, whether it's, you know, websites, whether it's YouTube, whether it's social media, whether it's podcasts, you know? So I was very grateful to be connected with an amazing cycling coach in South Wales, who had facilitated other world and Paralympic um, cycling champions previously to then hand them over to British cycling. So Neil Smith from Disability Sport Wales is a facilitator. So he, he's, he's almost like a talent scout for cycling who then takes people then um, to the point where they're ready to hand over then to, uh, to British cycling, to the elite, shall we say. Yeah. So let's talk about London 2012. I remember watching, watching it and specifically watching you whilst on holiday with my family in a cottage in Newquay in West Wales, which I think is better than Newquay in Cornwall, but that's not really relevant. <laughs> but I remember me and my family, we were watching it. My cousins were watching you at London 2012. So why don't you talk a little bit about what that was like. And it was on your home turf as well, our home turf. Exactly. Now, I would never recommend breaking your back, okay? <laughs> I really wouldn't. Um, but I suppose it happened at almost the right time. You know, th there's never a good time, but it was the right time. And when I was privileged then to join British Cycling, you know, in 2011, and, you know, I raced in five races over that summer. I came back with five medals. I took a silver in the road worlds in the time trial behind... Um, a gentleman from Germany called Mikhail Teuber, who was the gold medalist from Beijing, you know, from the, the Beijing Paralympics. So to finish 32 seconds behind Mikhail Teuber, literally 18 months after breaking my back, you know, was, um, what was just a, an encouragement for me because I thought, well, if I can keep getting faster and stronger and lighter, it's going to be a race the race is going to be on in London, you know? Yeah. So, so when I took a silver in the, the road wheels in the 10 mile time trial, that gave me the encouragement and belief as a human being to follow the process. And then in September, 2011, I was um, invited by British cycling to be part of the world-class cycling program to then move from South Wales up to Manchester um, to live and train full time in Manchester as part of the world-class cycling program to then be part of the elite, you know, the Olympic and Paralympic legends that is British cycling, you know, and knowing that British cycling had formulated and delivered, you know, world champions, European champions, British champions, Olympic champions, Paralympic champions, I knew I was in good company. And as the old saying goes, you're known by the company you keep, you know, so I was very privileged to, to be invited to live um, and train full time, you know, 26 hours a week, you know, in Manchester with the elite, having the, the best cycling coaches in the world, okay? The best physiologists in the world, the best biomechanics in the world, the best nutritionists, the best mechanics, all of the great backroom staff that people don't get to see, you know? So, 
so September 2011 is when the journey really started because I was told categorically I had to give up chocolate, I had to give up alcohol, I had to be you know, structured to eat a certain amount of food at certain times, I had to drink certain amounts of fluid every day, I had to be in bed by 10 p.m. every night, I had to engage then my one hour power nap in the afternoon after training in the mornings, so it's, it's a very strict, but a very controlled environment for a reason, for a reason, you know, we, we're now training for the Olympics, you know, we're now training for the largest sporting event on the planet and to represent Paralympics GB, you know, at the home games was just going to be, yeah, I, I guess just a dream come true, you know, so living and working, I suppose you can call it working if you want. Living and working in that environment was just a privilege. It was like a movie, you know, turning up, training, and seeing Sir Bradley Wiggins, Tour de France winner, in the gym, you know, <laughs> seeing, you know, Geraint Thomas, you know, the Welsh, you know, Tour de France winner, you know, training, you know, and then being on the track, training on the Tuesday and the Thursday with Sir Chris Hoy, probably the most prestigious a track sprinter in the history of track cycling. And he's literally putting his cycling shoes on, sat next to me. <laughs> <laughs> it's quite surreal. Quite surreal, you know. I can imagine it must have... No, that's a lie. I can't imagine. I can't imagine what it's it was weird. like. It was all. really weird. Yeah, really weird. But the, the run-up to London, just to give all the listeners and obviously the audience watching this on YouTube... Um, it, it was like a movie, you know, it really was. And then certainly that summer, okay, the epic summer of sport, which was the London 2012 Olympics and Paralympic Games, when the whole country, if not the whole world, got behind the athletes, you know. And in the UK, I guess we were privileged to have a, a, a Wimbledon winner. You know, we had a Tour de France winner, you know. Um, and then, you know, when the Olympics started, you know, that sort of June, July period, um, it, uh, it was incredible, you know, Team GB were just literally winning gold medals for fun, you know, it was just an incredible, incredible atmosphere where the whole country, you know, got behind the athletes and there was just such a, um, I don't know whether you felt this with your family, but such a buzz, such a positive buzz, yeah. you know, that maybe the country didn't have, you know, when, uh, when the Beijing Olympics and Paralympics were on in 2008, you know. Oh, absolutely. That buzz can be felt all around. As I always remember when we were there as a family, you know, all 12 of us, you know, distant family, all in this one holiday house. We were all watching sports that we've never been interested in in our lives together and still feeling that pride, still yeah. feeling that pride of Britain. Yeah, yeah. Did you feel like you were actually part of it? Yeah, you know, no one was sitting down. We were all up on our feet cheering it all. <laughs> about sports we've never watched in, in our lives before and that's the beauty of it to me that really is the beauty of it yeah i think it's so important for people to be open-minded okay yeah. and you know we'll, we'll finish the um, the paralympic story now um you know with some key messages so this is what i was taught at british cycling okay this is what i was taught by the elite you know by an incredible um sports psychiatrist and psychologist called professor Steve Peters. And Professor Steve Peters is the author of an incredible, famous book, um, you know, number one selling book called The Chimp Paradox. And The Chimp Paradox talks about the, the different parts of the brain, different parts of our mind, of how we manage the brain, you know, through having the human side of the brain. You know, we obviously then have the primate part of the brain, which Dr. Steve Peters calls the chimp. You know, this voice that we all have in our heads and then the computer and the computer part of your brain is what allows you to do things without you having to think. So it's almost that subcognitive behavior like driving a car, walking, certainly cycling. You know, you get to the point where you've you know, cycled for thousands and thousands of hours. You just do it subconsciously. You don't think about it, even though you're aware of the surroundings through safety, speed, et cetera, et cetera but subcognitively, you know. So I think going into British cycling at the age of, um, you know, 
literally 41, 42, um, I was coachable, okay, which is so important. I was open-minded to learn new skills and then to be coached to apply those skills. And I just embraced it, you know, with both arms. And I just kept telling myself, I've got to do this, you know. And after maybe, I don't know, six or seven months of training, you know, British Cycling take you into a, a process where you're, you're almost in a state of exhaustion, you know, sort of two or three months before the games. And, and, and that's part of the process because you train and train and train to almost exhaustion, but then you back off and then you rest and recover. The training still continues, but albeit slightly, you know, at a, a, a lesser uh, intense um, level. And that's when the magic happens. That's when the body improves, it gets faster, gets stronger, you know, and, uh, and then I'll never forget being, you know, being in Los Angeles, it was um, February 2012, racing in the World Track Championships. And my dad at the time had stomach cancer and we knew he was really unwell, you know, no fault of his own, just ended up with this horrendous illness that was just, yeah, he was just wasting away, you know, and it, it broke my heart to see my hero, my inspiration, my go-to guy, just literally, you know, I suppose, dying before my eyes, you know? So, so February 2012 was a big turning point for me because when I was in Los Angeles, uh, racing in the track worlds, as I said, um, a day before the finals, um, I received a phone call from my mother, Margaret, to say that unfortunately, um, my dad, who was known, as I said, as Mr. Nice Guy, um, unfortunately had passed away in his sleep, you know? So, so that moment in time for me was um, a reflection on how cruel life can be, you know, having seen my mother go through breast cancer, through a mastectomy, you know, my, my parents watched me break my back, you know, nearly getting killed and then being selected by British Cycling. So I was on this huge roller coaster, you know, this huge roller coaster um, of emotions and uh, decisions and feelings that, you know, sometimes really pushed, pushed the boundaries. But then to lose my dad, you know, that was, um, yeah, that was heartbreaking. You know, a day before the track world finals. So I'll never forget then speaking to Professor Steve Peters on the phone. You know, he was back in the United Kingdom. And he said these words to me, please understand that unfortunately, your dad's not coming back. Okay, it's fact. Please understand he's passed away. Um, there is no way to bring him back. Do you understand? I said, yes. He said, please understand that one day in the future, your day will come when your eyes were closed for good. So what he meant by that was that we didn't, or I didn't have at the time, any choice because my dad's not coming back. But the only choice that I actually had was what I was going to do the next day in the world finals. And that was to race, you know, for Great Britain, to race for my country, to represent 63 million people on that track in Los Angeles, you know. So the next day, you know, I, I wiped my tears. I focused logically, not emotionally. And, uh, and obviously delivered to bring back, you know, that world championships gold medal, you know, for my country to win the, the very famous uh, rainbow jersey, you know, which is the, the white cycling jersey with the rainbow stripes across the middle. To, I guess, bring that medal back to unfortunately, you know, take part in my dad's funeral, which, uh, which was heartbreaking. You know, it really, really was heartbreaking for me. And I guess then, you know, focusing again, Going back to, you know, going back to, to Manchester, I guess the epic summer of sport and the run-up, you know, to the London 2012 Paralympic Games was just, yeah, just feelings and emotions and, you know, memories that uh, I'll never, ever forget, you know. So, so yeah, I'm just so grateful, so, so grateful, you know, for, for the privilege, for the opportunity, for the memories, friendships, um, and, yeah, just deep down. I knew that you know I was living out the childhood dream, um, and we just didn't know what was going to happen, because as I said, I just wanted to get there. You know that yeah. that was the that was the whole concept was just to get there. You know. So when you were there, was there ever a time when you thought I could actually do this? When you were actually going, obviously you, you always aim for the best. But was there a time when you thought I might actually get the gold or get? two world records in the same day, for example. No, I suppose at the time, looking back, you know, I, I knew I had the ability to, 
to give 100% because, you know, thanks to the words of Professor Steve Peters that he said to me when we, when we did the, um, the interview, you know, before going into the, the races, you know, because I raced in three races. And the, the first two races, you know, I won a silver in the sprint um, on the velodrome. I won a silver in the 10-mile time trial, um, you know, to, to end up finishing uh, 12 seconds, you know, behind Michael Teuber from Germany you know, who beat me by, you know, literally one second a mile. Um, but the important thing is that I, I gave it my best shot. I gave it 100% and just had to accept the outcome. And that was the words from Professor Steve Peters, you know. He said, Mark, do you, um, do you have any, any concerns or any questions, you know? Um, do you have any anxieties? And I said, well, the only fear I have is, is, is not, you know, is not winning that gold. You know, what, what if I, what if I finish last? You know, what if I don't deliver? And he said, well, let me ask you this question. In this three kilometer pursuit, in the, the race that I'm the world champion in, you know, at the time, are you going to give that race 99% or are you going to give it 100%? And I said, well, I'm, I'm going to give it 100%. He said, well, that's great because you then have to accept the outcome. Whatever that outcome is going to be, whether you win a bronze, a silver, or a gold, or whether you finish last, you have to accept the outcome. So in other words, your performance is your gold medal, if that makes sense. So by being the best you can be, becoming the best, and giving the best, that's all you can do. And then you have to accept the outcome. And when you accept the outcome, then you can move on. Then you can move on with your life, because life goes on. Of course it goes on. Because time doesn't stand still for no man. And, and there's a, a saying that I say on stage now as an international speaker that, you know, this is why I'm so grateful. Because time, time is the only commodity we cannot buy back. You know, because time moves on and when it's gone, it's gone. So acceptance and, you know, moving forward is so, so important for, for mindset as well as um, physical, you know, as well as well so going into going into the 31st of august 2012 which was the day of the three kilometer pursuit so qualifications in the morning and as the world champion i had the luxury then of actually riding last so that morning i watched all the other riders participate in the qualifications and the the young lad that raced before me is the the lad who won the sprint from China, a wonderful young lad called Yang Zi. And Yang Zi is 18 years younger than me. So at the time I was 42, he was about 24, okay? And he actually won um, the qualification round in his race. And he actually broke the world record in my yeah. event. How, <laughs> how rude, yeah. <laughs> yeah. how rude. So I'm sat there in the pen in the middle of the velodrome. You know, there's 7,000 people in the, in the velodrome that day. And my coach um, at the time, a gentleman called Tom Stanton, says to me, this young lad's pretty quick, isn't he? I said, yeah, he's, he's, he's really quick, you know? And in training, I'd been riding there or thereabouts around sort of four minutes, four minutes, one for the 12 laps, okay? And, and now we're in the, you know, in the Paralympic Games, you know, I've been selected, you know, just so joyful, so appreciative. I've won two silvers. The, the velodrome is packed. You know, the atmosphere is just unbelievable. And, and now I've got to go and break the world record just to get into the final, you know? So we set the schedule for three minutes, 55 seconds, okay? So that, that feeling, you know, the, the velodrome was just rammed to the rafters. And it was just, yeah, just an incredible memory for me. So, so that morning, you know, um, having to break the four minute barrier in my, in my category, you know, in my classification category was like the, like the Sir Roger Bannister moment in athletics. I was the first C1, you know, C1 athlete, C1 rider to go under four minutes, you know, and I broke the world record that morning. I smashed it by seven seconds and came off the track, you know, big hug to the coach, high five to the mechanics and just couldn't believe what I'd done, you know. And my coach, Tom, said to me, how are you feeling? You know, how are you feeling? And I said, well, I feel fine, but that was easy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, 
because I was in such good nick. I was in, I was so fit, so strong, you know, as a 42 year old man who, you know, was just in such a great shape, you know, um, it, it just felt easy. Okay. Don't get me wrong. It bloody hurt. You know, <laughs> it really hurt. You know, my lungs were burning, my legs were burning, you know, but, um, but it just felt easy because I just followed the process. So I, I started to think logically, not emotionally. I wasn't thinking of the 7,000 people in the crowd. I was thinking about preloading the pedals, wait for the gun to go off, accelerate hard as I can into the first corner, then relax, then take the, you know, take the tri bars, settle, and then it was time to hurt myself. And, and I guess, yeah, breaking that world record was just crazy, you know? So, so four hours later um, was the final, you know, literally, you know, quarter past three that afternoon. And I'll never forget warming up, you know, on the track center that afternoon. And my Tom, you know, my coach Tom coming over to me and saying, look, I've looked at this kid's time from this morning and he's really quick. Over four or five laps, he's really quick, you know. And, um, and you know, what schedule would you like to set? And I said, look, just, just set it the same as this morning. I'm just going to smash this out of the park because I was so grateful just to be there. Now it was time to rewrite the history books. You know, now it was time to shine. Yeah. Now it was to, now it was time to turn the impossible into possible. You know, and it was just that one moment in time that was never going to happen again. I had one chance, one opportunity to perform, to win that Paralympic gold medal. You know, and after warming up, we selected you know the the schedule to set it at three minutes fifty five, the same as the morning, and we felt that if Yang Zi was in between three fifty five and four minutes, the race is on. You know, but if he then blows a gasket and he rides over four minutes, the race is mine. You know, we just had to follow the process. So I'll never forget finishing my warm up. They called my name and my number, Mark Colborne, Great Britain, number 42, which was my age, yeah. which was really weird. You know, um, you can't, you can't write that stuff, can you? You no, know, you can't. Um, and then the bike was positioned into the gate on the track and then the physio then helped me up onto the track and then climbed onto the bike, you know, very slowly, very carefully. I kept thinking to myself, don't fall. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> the whole world's watching. Don't yeah. fall. Take your time. Be calm. Follow the steps, you know, think logically, you know, and then sitting on the saddle, clipping him, you know, my, my right foot first into the pedal, then clipping in my left foot and then thinking to myself, you know, now it's time to perform. I've been waiting, I don't know, 30 odd years for this one moment in time. All of the life experiences I've been through, all the traumas, all the heartaches, the upsets, okay, all the really tough times. Now it was time for me to unleash the warrior mindset and to win at no cost, okay, at no cost to myself because I just had to give it everything, absolutely everything. So I'll never forget Tom, you know, walking up the track and saying to me, um, Mark, are you ready? I said, yes, I'm 100% ready. Because everything had been checked. The bike had been checked. The kit had been checked. The skin suit, the helmet, my cycling shoes. I'd done all the training I could, you know, thousands and thousands and thousands of hours of training. I would literally ticked off every box when it came to food, diet, lifestyle, being, you know, being positive, knowing my ability. And I'll never forget looking over on the left-hand side and seeing the clock just tick down. And then when it got to 12 seconds, you get the first beep, which means 12 seconds to go, you know? And Tom said to me, Mark, one last message, do this for your dad. And then the commissaire, who was like, you know, the, the, the commissaire on the side of the track, um, the representative for, you know, the Paralympic Games, puts his flag in the air, the green flag, to say that I was ready. And then it was time to perform. So I'll never forget watching that clock tick down. And then obviously the famous five beeps, you know, beep, 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 beep. And I'll never forget Callum gripping my handlebars, literally like I was hanging off a cliff, 
tighter than I've ever, ever, ever grasped anything, ever in my life. And I'm holding on for dear life. And I'll never forget preloading and pushing the left pedal when that gun went off and just breathing in as deep as I could to accelerate into the first corner, you know, as hard as I could. So picture the scene, you know, I've accelerated, you know, I've completed the first lap, I've settled down onto the tri bars, and now it was time, as I said, to hurt myself. Because you have to push your, your body to the, the boundaries you've never, almost never been to before, you know. And then lap two, I'm now up to optimum speed, which is about 30 miles an hour. And then literally it was just metronomically time to count down the laps. Keep breathing really deep, you know, keep the flow of the pedals going, but control it. Because remember, three kilometers or two miles, 12 laps of the velodrome, it's a long way to go flat out. Yeah. You know, you, 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 you're going to get the lactic acid buildup when you get to about lap four, lap five. Okay. And then you just literally hang on, you know, um, for, for literally for grim death, you know, for, for the rest of the race, you know. And I remember coming around the track on lap eight and absolutely being on schedule, the same world record schedule as the morning. And knew, I just knew in my heart that I just felt like I was getting faster, you know. But what I felt was that adrenaline. I felt that adrenaline build up in my body, you know, and breathing in as deep as I can. And, and it was so hot in the velodrome, 28 degrees in the velodrome, in the Queen Elizabeth Olympic velodrome that afternoon, you know, and, and just, just feeling this dryness in my mouth, you know, trying to breathe in, you know, as deep as I possibly could, you know, and, um, and coming around the track then on, you know, lap 10, lap 11, and I literally could see Yang Zi literally in front of me, you know, and just, just knowing in my heart that I could see this guy, you know, this young lad, literally, I don't know, 70 or 80 meters ahead of me on lap 11. And I'm thinking to myself, oh my gosh, I, I can see him. And if I can see him, I just need to stay upright and don't fall yeah. off, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know? And my brain said, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, you've won. But I hadn't won, not yet. I'd almost won. I just need to, needed to stay upright, keep pedaling, keep hurting myself, keep dealing with the pain in my legs and my lungs, you know? And I'll never forget Callum coming around on the last lap. The bell started to ring, you know, ding, 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 ding. Mark Coburn, who broke his back in a paragliding fall when his ring collapsed and he fell 40 feet. That was in May 2009. In August 2012, he is about to become a Paralympic gold medalist. Look at him fly. There's, it might, he might not even reach it. Yes, it will, just about. He won't catch him in three kilometres. The bell has gone for the last lap. Yeah, the coach has given up on telling what schedule he's on. He's just pointing at the Chinese rider. Go and catch him. He's closing in rapidly and he might just get on his slipstream as he comes off this banking into the finishing straight. He's 100 metres behind him as he lines up for the finish. The world record has just gone by, but he doesn't care. He, oh, my God, it hasn't! It hasn't! It's one... It's, oh, I'll have to work it out. It's about 11, 11 hundredths of a second. He's got the world record again. Incredible. What a way to win a gold medal. Just that feeling of crossing the line looking up at the scoreboard and thinking to myself, oh my gosh, I've just broke the world record again. <laughs> yeah. Unbelievable, you know, unbelievable. So that feeling that afternoon, yeah, it was just, yeah, just it, like I said, it's just like a dream, just like a dream, you know. It is incredible hearing it again. It was incredible watching it at the time, watching it back and just, and still hearing the way you speak about it, what's this, eight years on? Yep. Eight years on, and you can still see the passion and the pride you have for not just that moment, but everything and what you do. I think, you know, you summed this up earlier on, okay? It, it is a passion, okay? Because of the old saying, you know, excellence is not an act, it's a habit. And when you make, you know, 100% process is a habit, Things happen. So to bring this, you know, Paralympic gold medal back to, you know, Wales, to win this Paralympic gold medal, you know, for Paralympics GB, 
you know, I suppose to win it for my dad as well, you know, it's so, so important, but this, this was my childhood dream. You know, it just took me 30 years to achieve it, you know, if that makes sense. So for people listening to the podcast, you know, maybe, you know, obviously, you know, go over to YouTube, to Callum's YouTube channel. You can see the Paralympic gold medal on the screen, you know, in its uh, presentation box. And uh, yeah, I'm just so, so, so grateful. You know, I really, really am. And I do, I do pinch myself some days, mate, if I'm honest, (laughs) you know. How important is that just to always stay humble really so important it's priority it's absolutely priority like i said earlier on when we started okay nobody on this planet is any different to anybody else we just have different skill sets we just have different passions different emotions different feelings but we all have a you know a belly button a stomach and a pulse basically so why should you treat anybody else any different you know, and, um, and now I meet people all around the world, you know, because obviously I've retired from, you know, from the world-class cycling program. Um, you know, I chose a career as, as an international speaker to travel the world as a conference speaker to help other people, you know, to um, learn the skills of winning with mindset um, and help those people to aspire and live out their dreams, you know, which is really important. And to date, you know, I presented at, you know, 215 conferences. I probably inspired well over 250,000 people in those conferences, you know. So, and, you know, online, you know, conferences and, you know, networking events and charity events. Because for me, it's all about enjoying the journey and knowing, knowing that, that I've done the right thing, you know. Yeah, absolutely. So is it fair to say that, Stuff like the gold medals, the MBs, that's just extra. That's just on top of the journey. That's just uh, an outcome. Yeah, I think um, I think the awards, the medals, they are they are just something we aspire for. Okay, yeah. to win. Okay, whatever that is in life. Um, but but never forget in the journey. You know, enjoy the journey just as much as the success. In my opinion, you know, it's so, so important. Um, and yes, you know, I've, I've now lived out that childhood dream. Um, you know, I've got the medal. You know, I was awarded the MBE by His Royal Highness Prince Charles um, in the New Year's Honours list. And yeah, just same again, just so grateful, you know, um, having gratitude and being authentic. Just removing that mask, you know, remove the mask of authenticity. Just be who you are but just be the best of who you are. That's, yeah, that's that's exactly the message that I want. That's why I set up the Schofield stories. That's, you know, it's just to be authentic, be who you are and accept it. Now, quite a few, you met the Queen, don't you? You met the Queen? Yes, yes. I was very privileged to meet the Queen in uh, November 2012 after the Paralympic Games, um, having an evening tea with the Queen. Um, and there were a hundred, you know, almost a hundred other, um, you know, Olympic and Paralympic medalists there that night as well. And once again, that was just an incredible memory, a moment in time I'll never forget, you know, speaking to possibly one of the most famous, yeah, probably the most famous people in the world, you know, yeah. just having that two minute conversation yeah. was uh, incredible. You know, we spoke about the Paralympics, we spoke about, um, you know, my disability, you know, the Queen was um, very kind to ask me, you know, what was, what was my disability? And I explained about my accident and winning my medals at London and just how proud I felt to represent my country. And, and then, you know, obviously having the privilege of meeting, you know, His Royal Highness Prince Charles when I received my award, you know, my MBE. And I guess that day to take my mother, you know, and my daughter to Buckingham Palace, probably the most prestigious you know house stroke palace in the world it was it was my mother's day you know it was it was a day for her to reflect enjoy see her son you know who'd been through hell and back to live out that childhood dream and I'll never forget taking you know my mother and my daughter into the palace walking in you know through the arch into the reception area and just seeing the just seeing the look on my mother's face (laughs) (laughs) And she said, she, she said to me, she said, oh my gosh, you know, your dad would never believe this, would he? 
<laughs> you know, so yeah, it's uh, it's been a, a, an, an incredible journey, an amazing, epic journey, to be honest with you. But, you know, I just felt it was the start, the start of things to come, you know. And now as an international speaker, you know, as a healthcare pre- professional, you know, in the health and wellness industry, um, you know, being partnered with one, well, probably the number one nutritional cleansing company in the world, I feel now I'm creating another legacy, mm-hmm. having been part of, you know, the, the, the legacy of London 2012. And now my goal and my vision, you know, is to help this company impact world health, you know. So for people listening to this podcast, you know, if you want to know more, please feel free to go to uh, markcolborn.com. Um, or visit, you know, healthwithmark.com and uh, more than happy to help people answer questions, you know, more than happy to help as many people as I can, you know, because it's, uh, it's important for me for a, a pers- from a personal perspective. You know. And that shows that despite everything, you're still a lad or a normal upbringing from a Welsh town. You just... You know, like you say, you treat everyone as your best friend, and I can tell that, and I'm sure my listeners and viewers will feel exactly the same. Yes, hundred percent, very much so. You know, I learned that as a ten year old, um, the authenticity to be who you really are. Don't pretend to be somebody you're not. Why, why, why would you? Why do you need to be? You know, I guess I've just had that opportunity that I said yes to. You know, um, I've been through apprehension. As I said, fear, doubt. I've had anxiety. You know, I've had um, suicidal thoughts. Um, you know, I've had. I, I've yeah, I've I've literally gone from hell to the top of the world. You know, and for people who want to know how that happened, you know, people people I suppose know my story. They see the process, so they know how the process and unvo- how it unfolded. But if you want to know why. I made those decisions, then yeah, go to markcolborn.com and, uh, and then obviously do your, do your research and due diligence and reach out. I'm here to help. I'm here to listen, you know, um, and if I can help, I will. If I can't, then I'll point you in the right direction to somebody else. Well, I've said it before on this episode, but it's different in person. What you read will get you so far, but actually speaking to you, you know, I'm counting myself lucky. I really am. And I'm very grateful for this. I think it's a really good point to end the show as, as our listeners probably know, being two South Wales lads, we could probably talk for another few hours, but for the sake of my list, I think we should wrap things up. So what would you say is your final words, messages, and just, yeah, what would you say to my incredible listeners and viewers? Yes, I think the first thing I want to say is thank you. Thank you for listening. I guess, yeah, thank you for giving up your time, you know, to spend your time listening to this podcast, to watch the, you know, the video on YouTube and, and just understand and know that I, I really appreciate you giving up your time. And I think the advice I would give to people is whatever you aspire for in life, okay, whatever that dream is, remember that you only have a short period of time to achieve it, okay? If you never achieve it, that's also okay. But what's not okay is not trying, okay? Like Michael Jordan once said, probably the most famous basketball player of all time, okay? I can accept failure because everyone fails at something. But what I cannot accept is not trying. So my advice to you, my friends, because we're all friends now, Okay, <laughs> we we're, all, we're, all, we're all friends all over the world. It's a small village. The world is such a small place now, you know, that whatever you aspire for, whatever true feelings, whatever true passion you have to enjoy in life, whatever that is, okay, find out who's done it before. Find out the process. Have belief in the process. Have belief in you as a human being and then have belief in you doing the process. But have the confidence to reach out to other people. Find out who's done it before. Speak to them. Ask advice. Okay? Because if you don't ask, you don't get. Okay? If you don't ask, you don't get. So, so my wish for you all is that you enjoy a prosperous life, a happy life, um, 
a life of fulfillment and gratitude. And just, just enjoy the journey because it is a journey, not, yeah, think, think about this, you know, happiness is not a destination. It's just a journey, you know? So, so thank you, Callum. Thank you for inviting me on to the Scorpion Stories. I really appreciate it, my friend. And uh, yeah, I think we're going to be friends for life. Definitely. And you know, what else do you want? It's honestly been my honor to have you on the show. Thank you, Mark. Thank you. Good luck, everybody.